Well, today is my birthday. Not my physical birthday, but my spiritual birthday. It was 50 years ago on April 16th, 1972, that I became a follower of Jesus. I can't believe it. It's been so fast. And I'm so grateful to God for all that he has done for me in these 50 years. But I thought today would be a great day to talk about how it is that the Lord Jesus brought me into his family. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. Hello, friends. Welcome to Open Line with Dr. Michael Radelnik. I am Michael Radelnik, professor of Jewish studies and Bible at Moody Bible Institute. I'm so glad to be with you today and every week right here at the radio kitchen table for what is usually our Bible study across America. But today, if you have questions, just go to our our webpage, openlineradio.org, and post the question there. It says, ask Michael a question. You can put your question there. And next week, or the week after, or sometime after that, we'll get to your questions. But today, it's a pre-recorded program, and it's what I'd like to do is talk about how the Lord uh, worked in my life and brought me into his kingdom. I'm really grateful to him for doing that. And so that's what we're about today. So no calls today. Appreciate it uh, that you want to ask a question, but just go to our website and post them there for the mailbag. Trisha McMillan, as always, is our producer. Courtney Young is handing, handling all things, all technical, everything that there is to do. But I have a special guest today, a special guest host in a sense. Uh, I thought it's really kind of hard to tell the story uh, of how God has worked and how uh, God has brought me into his family and uh, a faith story. I thought, I need someone to help me make sure I stay on track. And uh, instead of just talking to you by myself, I've asked a friend to come and join me right now, and he'll be asking the questions and kind of directing me. And I really appreciate him. Chris Fabry, my uh, old friend and mentor in radio. Uh, thank you, Chris, for joining me. I'm, I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to go to corral you if I can. Okay, there we go. That's what we're going to do. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know if you can, but you can try, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we're not exactly. going to talk about the New York Yankees at all during this whole thing. Not at all. Okay? No, no, no. Zero. Uh, zero about the Yankees. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of hope. In, and we're not going to talk about the New York <laughs> Knicks, who've had a most dismal season once again. So that's... Uh, I am a New Yorker. I love those teams. I actually met an NFL quarterback this past weekend, and he really? said, yeah, he said to me, uh, are you a New York fan still? And I said, yeah. He says, Giants? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, <laughs> too, too bad for you. So, uh, See, I brought I said, it up, yeah. folks. I brought yeah. it up, and, and he, yeah. here he goes. Yeah. I'm honored that, to be here, Michael. I'm yeah. honored to be here, at, to, especially on this, you know, 50 years on, on to the day. Yeah. It, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really appreciate you joining me. And what I, you know, I thought I've, I've told my story, my faith story on Open Line every year, right in mid April for about five minutes as the opening word on the program, just because I, I love talking about what the Lord has done. And I, I think it's a, a fun remembrance. I think it's great to be able to tell our story. Uh, and I think that's exactly what Paul did every time he was on trial. He just went right back to his faith story of how he came to know the Lord Jesus. And so I thought, yeah, I, w- I want to do that. But since it's 50 years, instead of throwing a big old party, which I would like to do, but, uh, you know, no one will come. So the, the <laughs> my friends are scattered across the country and the world. So I thought, well, I'll do a party right here with the listeners of Open Line, and I'll I'll tell them the story in detail, far more detail than than I usually do when I do my little five minute story. So yeah. you, you ready to get jump started? In? Yeah, let's yeah, do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can't understand your story, and you know where you where you stand. I can't know where you stand until I find out where you sit, and that is the backstory, your family, and and the soup that you grew up in. Tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about that. Yeah, both my parents were Holocaust survivors. My dad was from a little village in Poland. It was called Chmielnik, uh, and that he had he became a cabinet maker, furniture maker. He was married. He had four sons. One of his brothers had a daughter, and he was so many children he couldn't afford to raise her. So he actually gave his daughter to my dad uh, to raise. So he adopted her. So he had five children, and was 
working as a, as a furniture maker and cabinets and things like that prior to power tools kind of amazingly skilled individual and then uh hitler came to power uh in germany 1939 he invades poland uh conquers poland sends jews to the ghetto uh ultimately my dad was sent to a labor camp because of his skills in carpentry and that actually preserved his life but his wife and five children were sent to Auschwitz where they were murdered. And as far as my dad understood, <clears throat> this was the action of Christians. Uh, he, he always associated the murder of his family, and not only just his, his wife and children, but his, uh, his parents, his grandparents on both sides, and six, five, uh, he was one of six siblings, and four of them uh, were also murdered. So uh, his, the, most of his family, other than his immediate family, perished in Treblinka, mm. another death camp. And uh, he always associated this with followers of Jesus. This is what they do. Then so it my was, it was uh, his ability then in carpentry that really saved his life. Yeah, it was, exactly. And that's one of the things they've discovered about survivors is that usually they had some skill that uh, the Nazis wanted to appropriate and use. Uh, I know a man who survived because he could cut women's hair. And so the SS officers used him at the Auschwitz labor camp to cut uh, SS officers' wives' hair. So, wow. What amazing uh, the, the stories of survivors. Uh, my so, mom so, has skill too. So. so, your dad's family basically wiped away. Mm-hmm. As far as, you know, you never met them, you maybe heard about them. What about your mom? Yeah, my mom was from uh, eastern Germany, a, uh, an area called Upper Silesia. Uh, today, the area she's from is in Poland, but back then it was in Germany. And uh, she was raised uh, there in a much more modern, my dad was Orthodox, uh, Hasidic background with the the side curls and that that kind of uh, uh, very traditional Judaism. My mom was much more modern, uh, observant Jewish family, but still modern. Uh, her her dad had come from Poland to Germany after World War One and had been a naturalized citizen in Germany. Uh, and uh, what happened when uh, Hitler came to power in Germany? Uh, it wasn't very long after that that he fled back to Poland, uh, had to actually, uh, having been a a naturalized citizen. Uh, Her mom uh, became quite ill, and so my mom, her name was, my mom's name was Ruth, uh, uh, my mom went, well, they, her mom was sick, her dad was gone, so what she did is she uh, her her brother, Herbert, was taken by the grandparents, but they said they could only care for one child, and so she was placed in a Lutheran orphanage, which God had his hand in that. My mom was placed in this Lutheran orphanage as an 11 or 12-year-old, and uh, she they were very gracious to her and kind to her and loved her, and these it was run by Lutheran deaconesses. These were, I, the only way you can describe it is Protestant nuns. Hmm. And, and they were nurses, and they trained my mom as a nurse when she was in high school. They also, as she was growing up, they sent her to the local synagogue daily. When they were teaching Bible classes for the orphans, my mom was sent to the rabbi uh, for Hebrew school, and she was taught Judaism. Uh, so they didn't try to impose their faith on her. But by the time my mom was 16, she became... A follower of Jesus, she she identified as a follower of Jesus because of the testimony, the loving testimony of these dear women who were trying their best to keep her safe from the Nazis. Mm. Uh, so, isn't it interesting that your dad associated Christianity with those who murdered his family? Your mom, because of the mercy and grace of mm-hmm. the people who took care of her, associated it then different, much different. Yeah, she. 
she definitely saw it differently. And what happened was uh, 1938, the the infamous Kristallnacht, uh, when uh, there was a nationwide attack on Jewish people all over Germany, uh, these women said, this is not safe for you. And so they sent her to a deaconess house, a sisterhood, a sister deaconess house in Poland to get her out of Germany. And of course, then uh, the following year, September 1st, 1939, uh, my uh, my mom was in Poland when the Nazis invaded, and that's when she was captured and sent to the ghetto mm-hmm. initially. So uh, that's the uh, that's the circumstance she was in. But it's really true, and you could see the spiritual uh, growth that happened in my mom, uh, the dif- the ups and downs, whatever. But it was. She never associated Nazism with Christianity. Instead, she associated, uh, or, or Messianic faith, as I would call it, she associated belief in Jesus with those lovely women who cared as much as they could for her. And, and it led to my mom becoming a believer. On the other hand, my dad was always embittered and always closed because of that association. And there were many people who were uh, of the Nazis that he encountered who were, at least we would say, professing Christians. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, But Isn't yeah, you're right about that contrast. And then, and then I know that her faith, though, was secret. So why don't we take a break and yeah. we'll come back and we'll talk more about your, your mom's faith and then your coming to faith 50 years ago, Michael. This is incredible. Yeah, I'm so excited that we get to talk about it. I'm really grateful for my friend Chris Fabry being here with me on Open Line for my 50th spiritual birthday. Stick with us. We're going to be right back with more of the story of how the Right Elnicks came to faith. back. This is Michael Rydelnik on Open Line. Joining me today is Chris Fabry. It's a special day. No questions about the Bible, God, or the spiritual life. It's a pre-recorded program. Uh, but instead, we're talking about my 50th spiritual birthday. I, I am excited to tell the story of what God has done in bringing me to know him and taking me through all the storms and trials and joys and and all that for these last 50 years. And so we're going to talk about how I came to faith. But before that, I want to tell you about our current resource. Uh, it's a uh, just a terrific tool. It's something that I studied. Even when I was finishing seminary, I wanted to kind of take a book that would synthesize all that I had learned. And it was a great help. I used it countless times to help people in my congregations when I was teaching them what does the Bible teach? It's called A Survey of Bible Doctrine by Dr. Charles Ryrie. That's our current resource. Uh, when I studied under him, he had this unique ability as a professor to take profound truth and make it easy to understand. And that's why Dr. Ryrie said that this book is a book that will try to help you understand what the Bible teaches. How simple is that? And it's yours when you give the gift of any size to Open Line. Uh, we'd like to send you a copy, just a way to say thank you. So we'd like to send you a copy of a survey of Bible doctrine. All you have to do is call 888-644-7122 or go to openlineradio.org. And remember, when you give, ask for Dr. Ryrie's A Survey of Bible Doctrine. Well, Chris, did you ever read a survey of Bible doctrine? I don't think I ever have, but uh, it strikes me that what you just said about Dr. Ryrie is what you try to do here every time you're on the radio, right? Make the Bible <laughs> do understandable. Yeah. He is, he was, he's actually a role model for me about that, to take a profound truth and try and make it as accessible as possible, although I don't think I'm as good as he was at that, but yeah. I do my best. You know, he wrote books about uh, illustrations and object lessons for children. So there's this great theologian trying to help people mm. with object lessons for kids. That's uh, that's why I think he was such a great teacher. Hey, let's. Uh, we we were going to go back to talking about. Uh, yeah, I want to I'll jump to back in here. Yeah. Um, and and I have to find out how your mom and dad met, though. You just said yeah. that your mom went to the ghetto and your yeah. dad. Uh, so how did they meet? Well, after the war, my dad remarried another survivor almost immediately and she became 
pregnant. Both, by, I'll just say this: both my parents, as soon as they got out of the uh, concentration camp, my mom could barely walk. She couldn't walk at all uh, when she was liberated by the Russians. My dad was. They were both liberated the same day from the same concentration camp complex, the Gross Rosen concentration camp complex, and uh, my mom couldn't walk, uh, which actually saved her life. Uh, she, the all the women that could walk in the women's camp at Gross Rosen were uh, f- put on a forced march, and every one of them died to get them out of the 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 direction of the Russians who were coming to liberate the camp. And only those who couldn't walk were left behind, and that saved my mom's life. And so the Red Army liberated her on May eighth, nineteen forty five, and. Uh, same day for my dad, the camp was liberated in one of the men's camps there. It was a complex of camps. Uh, uh, he was uh, left there. And what happened was, as soon as they were strong enough and able enough, they made their way. They got out of the Russian sector of Germany and made their way to Berlin to the American sector. That's, they wanted to be with the Americans. They didn't want to be caught under the Soviet grip. And so uh, they were there. My mom, right after the war, when she was strong enough, went back to nursing. That She had been trained as a nurse by these deaconesses. She was an RN. She was working in a hospital. My dad remarried. His wife got pregnant, and she died. She was too weak. She had not yet recovered fully from being in concentration camp. This was another woman. She died in childbirth, had a premature baby. That was my half-brother. And he was in an incubator. Uh, born at seven months of gestation, and uh, he he was in an incubator in this German hospital, and my dad didn't know what he was going to do, How who would raise this baby with him. And so he saw my mom, whom he had once or twice run into in the Ludge ghetto, so he knew who she was. He was significantly older, and he did one of those bit on the roof kind of proposals. He said, I need someone to take care of this baby. Mm-hmm. I, I need you to marry me. And uh, my mom... I think knew better than to marry someone that didn't know the Lord, but she felt such compassion for this baby and sorrow for this man who had lost two wives now, and she had lost everyone, her parents, her brother, uh, who was brutally murdered by the Nazis, uh, her grandparents. She had one cousin that was getting out of the country and going to Argentina. That's the only person that she had left in her whole family. And so she agreed to marry my dad. Wow. And uh, they lived in the historic center of Berlin and uh, came to America in 1950. So, okay. And you were born in? I was born here in, uh, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, uh, about uh, seven years later. So, okay. <laughs> so your brother then, older than you, is older by what? Ten, ten years. Ten, ten years, okay. yeah. I'm, t- and, uh, see, I'm my doing sister, math. I, I, didn't know yeah. you were going to uh, yeah. hit there, me Didn't up know there was any math today. involved. <laughs> and so I had a sister born in Germany. She was a baby. She came to uh, to the United States with my parents when they finally could get out. And my other sister was born here. I have two older sisters. Uh, and then uh, my uh, I was born uh, and uh, at the peak year of the baby boom, the number one year of the baby boom. And... Uh, I was born 1957, grateful to God that he gave me life in this great country that I love. And uh, uh, gr- growing up in New York uh, in an observant Jewish home, here's what's, what my dad did that was really interesting. After the war, he lost his faith hmm. uh, because of all that he experienced. And then when he came to the United States, he saw that it was just a different world and he didn't want to give Hitler a posthumous victory of ceasing to live as a Jew. He thought, well, then Hitler will have succeeded even though he didn't kill me. I'm not living as a Jew. He would have destroyed another Jewish person. So my dad resorted, reverted to observant Judaism and I was raised in an observant Jewish home. I never knew that my mom believed in Jesus because my dad said, if you tell anyone that you believe this, I'll divorce you. So my mom became a secret believer. Okay, wait, we, wait, wait. So she she told him. When did she tell him? After they were she married? She told him when they got married. And it when was after married. they were married and they okay. were coming to America that he, he put the gag order on. And she didn't want a divorce. And so she thought she can believe in her heart. And she was a secret believer wow. for 
all those years uh, for something close to 25 years. Uh, she was a secret believer. And my dad, he, he was ready. He, didn't, he loved the idea of going to Israel. His only surviving sibling went to Israel as soon as uh, it became a state. Uh, but he said, I've, I've fought enough. He knew there would be wars in Israel and stress, and so he wanted to go to the United States. And that's why they came to the United States when uh, President Truman began to allow uh, some of the survivors into the United States. And, uh, and so we, we were, I was raised in New York, uh, you know, nice Jewish boy, observant. Uh, we kept kosher. Uh, I just was in uh, Israel, and I have a cousin in Israel who was talking to the group that we had, and she, she's totally secular. And they said, what was it like? They were, she was taking questions. She said, what was it like when you met Michael as a 10-year-old? And my cousin Dina said, the first thing I said to him was, take off your kippah, the, the skull cap that Jewish people wear. Right. I, I had a right. knit kippah on. And she was this secular teenager, and she just didn't be walk, want to be walking around with me in uh, this beach town where she lived with, a, with what appeared to be an observant Jew. And so she made me take off my kippah. I thought that was the funniest. Uh, <laughs> I didn't remember that, but it was true. That's the first thing she said to me yeah. So when we met. So, <laughs> 1957, and growing up, I mean, that's a talk about turmoil. You know, in the 60s, as you're as you're coming, yeah. you know, and then in teenager in the 70s, that's a yeah. turmoil of a time too. Yeah, it really was a tumultuous time. And although I have to say, I, I loved my upbringing. Uh, you know, it was a great time to be a New Yorker to live in Brooklyn, and uh, I, you know, I, I I was the only one in my family that liked baseball. Uh, I was the one, my dad didn't even understand it. Uh, I, I played basketball. I played baseball. I, I was, uh, as classic, a, a New York kid as could be and, uh, did well in school. My parents, you know, wanted me to be the first Jewish president, they said. Uh, and, uh, now I look back at that and I thought, oh boy, thank God that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good time. And it, it just went on really well, although it was a tumultuous time. I, you know, when you're a kid, I don't think you realize. No. I think uh, when the year that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, that's when I realized that this is a time that is worse than I, you know, worse than I imagined. It was yes. a terrible time, but I didn't realize it until that, those two events. Uh but uh, nevertheless, I I had a really happy childhood, uh, I would say, uh, although my dad was pretty tough. Uh, he was not an easy person. He was kind of angry still. He would tell me, you know, if anyone said anything anti-Semitic, I had a fight. And so mm-hmm. I was just, you know, use your fists. And uh, if, if I got a black eye and didn't do well in a fight, he'd send me out, look for the guy and do better next time. So... Hmm. Uh, yeah, he was a he was a tough guy uh, to uh, to cope with in that respect. But uh, I did like my childhood, and I was happy. But my parents started having some tensions, and that's really what shifted my mom. Uh, she she was having trouble in her marriage, and so she wrote to the deaconesses in Germany. Who I, I had seen their pictures. I didn't know that my mom believed this. I thought they were just people who cared for her during uh, the years of Hitler's rise. So she writes to them, wants to know if there's any Messianic Jews, Jewish followers of Jesus in the United States. And they said, we don't know of any, but we'll write to South Africa. We know a Jewish believer in Johannesburg. Maybe he'll know. And so he wrote to, said, yes, there's one in New York and she, he gave her the name. They sent through the these deaconesses. They sent her the name of the president of Chosen People Ministries, Daniel Fuchs, who then connected my mom with this Messianic congregation in Brooklyn. And then my mom went public. And my dad told her to either renounce this faith hmm. or he would divorce her. And uh, she couldn't do it. She said she's hidden it too long. I became furious with my mom. I thought she had betrayed 
her family. She had broken up my family, her family, because my dad divorced her over this. Uh, they broke up over this, and I thought that she was responsible for the divorce, and I thought she was responsible for everything bad that ever happened to the Jewish people, because I saw the world as us and them, uh, and she had just become a them. And, mm. and I couldn't believe that she would do that to our family. So she is, she's like somebody who gave you a black eye, in a sense. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I was really angry at her, but I was still underage. She had custody. And so, yeah, it's, uh, so that's when it began my fight with her about Yeshua. And so we'll talk about that when we come back. You're listening to Open Line with guest host Chris Fabry and me, Michael Ray Delnick. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. My name is Michael Rydelnik. You're listening to Open Line. Normally, we are taking your questions about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life, but not today. It's a pre-recorded program. Uh, it's a way of me celebrating what God has done in bringing me to faith 50 years ago today. April 16th, 1972 is my spiritual birthday, and I've asked uh, a partner in radio, a really good friend of mine, Chris Favory, to kind of help me talk through this story of how it is that God worked in my life to bring me to know him. Uh, by the way, Chris, you may not know this. You're, you're the guy that helped me most when I started doing radio and I was doing really bad. You may remember I called you and I said, what do I do, right? <laughs> I yeah, yeah, no, I remember that. I don't think you were doing... You were There were just some things that I want to get better at this and I don't know yeah. how to do that. And uh, yeah. I can't yeah. remember what I said, but... I'll tell you the thing I remember the most. You said, just have fun, but don't lose the FCC license. That's what you you said. (laughs) Yeah. So that's good. And, you know, so I I consider you my partner in radio, and I get to be on your program once a month. And uh, I want to, I'm using this as my transition to talk about partnership. And here's why Uh, Paul thanked God for the Philippians for their partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. And there are people who are partners with Open Line. They're called kitchen table partners. They're people who give monthly so I can be on weekly answering people's Bible questions. And I so appreciate them. And I so appreciate every listener who says that they're growing in their understanding of the Word and in their walk with the Lord. And if you're a listener and you find Open Line helpful in your walk with the Lord, would you consider becoming a partner, not just a listener, a kitchen table partner? Your monthly gift helps people from coast to coast and even around the world, grow in their walk with the Lord. As a bonus, I'll send you a Bible study moment every other week. It's a special audio Bible study designed exclusively for our Kitchen Table partners. Become a Kitchen Table partner today by calling 888-644-7122 or sign up online at openlineradio.org. Now, normally we'd be having the Far Eastern... Uh, broadcast company, the FEBC uh, mailbag right now, uh, Chris. But uh, we have no mailbag today. But I do appreciate FEBC.org where you can learn about their podcast and their ministry. You can go to FEBC.org and I appreciate their partnership as well with Open Line. Amen, amen. Can I just say a a word about that with partners? Uh, Mm -hmm. What I see this program doing is not just answering trivia, you know, just not not just answering, you know, how many angels can dance and all that stuff. It's for the believer who really wants, what does this, what does this mean here? What does it mean? How do I live this out? And then there are a lot of people who are listening who aren't necessarily believers, but they're interested in what the Bible says. So they're kind of listening over, you know, over your shoulder. But I think one of the great things that happens here is that a person hears, you know, this is what the Bible is teaching in this section or in this verse. And then they're able to go out and interact with other people who aren't listening to Christian radio and really give a reasoned approach. And it's like, I've never heard that before, because mm-hmm. that's where you were in this situation, Michael. Yeah. Your mom had been a believer for a long time. You didn't know it. When you found out, you thought she's betrayed us. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I was so angry at her. We couldn't even have a, a simple conversation. I couldn't 
speak with her without blowing up. And mm. then she she uh, started bringing these other middle-aged Jewish women to our house that, that she had met at this congregation that Chosen People had planted in Brooklyn. And they kept trying to talk to me. You know, I'd be going out to play basketball or something like that. And they would say, hey, would, would you look at this verse and tell us what? And I'm like, leave me alone. Come hmm. on. Uh, I was just so unhappy with them. And uh, so I, and my mom kept inviting me to come to the Bible study at the congregation or come to services on the weekend. And I kept saying, no, I'm not the least bit interested. Hmm. I don't care. And I wasn't. I was just really angry. And How then, old were you at this point? Were you like I was, uh I was 14. 14. Okay. So yeah. you'd already had your bar mitzvah, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so here and you were. The, you'd made this choice. You'd made this life. And, and now your mom's going a totally different direction. Uh, one other question. Did your mom and dad then, as after the divorce, did he move out and you stayed with her? Yeah, he moved out. And uh, in fact... Uh, in about two years after they divorced, uh, he moved to Israel and oh, lived wow. lived there for the rest of his life. So, uh, but at this point, uh, he was still in Brooklyn, in Brighton Beach, like the famous movie play. Right. Uh, uh, so he was living in Brighton Beach, which was uh, just a couple of miles from where we lived, and uh, he was he was still in touch with me. But my mom had custody. I was really angry. Uh, at, at her. And then uh, one day, my sister and I were in the car and we had to pick my mom up. And she was at a Bible study at this congregation. It was being taught by a woman named Hilda Kozer, uh, a Jewish woman, never married. She was one of the great uh, outreach workers to Jewish people of all time, I think. And uh, Miss Kozer was teaching uh, my mom and we had to pick her up from Bible study and I was really annoyed about that. Miss Kozer came out to the car. Oh, Michael, I love you. I've been thinking of you. I wanted to meet you. I'm like, leave me alone, lady. And uh, she invited me to services as well. That didn't happen. And then, well, I was constantly being badgered and fighting with my mom. And she said, just come once. My mom had this thing about Brussels sprouts. You know, if you don't like them, fine, but taste them once. Try them, One yeah. bite before you fight, you know. that's uh, <laughs> So I thought, I'll just go one time and tell her to shut up, you know. And uh, so actually what happened uh, before then, before that time I was going to go one time, uh, when Ms. Kozer came out to the car, I, she said, well, why don't we talk about this? And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to meet with this woman. I thought maybe once, maybe twice, and I'm going to show her why she's wrong, and then my mom will leave this foolishness. So I actually, uh, I was not far from where the congregation was, where I went to school, and I went there after school, and I sat down with Ms. Kozer, and we began to talk about Messianic prophecy. And it became every couple days that we would do this all winter long. Uh, we would sit down and I would argue with her about Messianic prophecy, whether it was uh, Isaiah 7.14 about the prophecy of Messiah's virgin birth or all these other prophecies, uh, the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and uh, just over and over, Psalm 22 about uh, the piercing of his hands and his feet. And we would argue. I had a book that gave me all the answers about why it couldn't be Jesus. And... Uh, we argued and argued and argued, and it was not friendly in the sense I was pretty angry. And Miss Kozer didn't take nonsense; she would argue back, uh, which I think look at the Book of Acts. Paul would argue the Scriptures, and that's what we were doing. And I was very confident I was right. And at night, I would just have these doubts that maybe Miss Kozer was right about this, hmm. and I was really distressed about it. But I never told her. And then she once challenged me to pray and ask God to show me if Jesus is the Messiah. And I said, don't have to, he's not. She said, well, what are you afraid of then? So mm. I, I believe that night I offered an extemporaneous prayer, which mostly Jewish prayers from a siddur, but I prayed to God and I offered the single worst prayer in the history of prayers, I believe. <laughs> it was like, God, I know Jesus isn't the Messiah, uh, but if he is and I know he's not, uh, then show me, but I know you won't because he's not. Amen. And <laughs> That is a terrible prayer. 
Yeah, it was terrible. You know, but but uh, God is a great God, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And so he he opened my heart. And uh, one of the things that Miss Kozer asked me was, uh, what do you do when you sin? I said, well, I really don't sin that much. And she said, what do you mean? I really was a nice kid. I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't doing anything that all my friends started to do. And uh, and I was a nice Jewish boy. And, and she said, but everyone sins. I said, yeah, well, that's what we have Yom Kippur for. And she showed me Leviticus 17.11, where it speaks about uh, the, uh, the, the without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. I've, I've, uh, I've given it to you upon the altar because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar uh, and it, to make atonement. And she said, you need to sacrifice. I said, we can't. The temple's destroyed. And she said, that's right. And then she, we read Isaiah 53. And I knew that was supposed to be about Israel, but as I read it, it was really clear to me in my head that that really fit uh, what happened to Jesus, that uh, we rejected him. He was despised and rejected, a uh, man of sorrows, uh, we, all we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us, all, of us all. He was pierced through for our iniquities. The chastisement for our well-being was upon him. I'm like, oh, this sounds exactly like what Ms. Kozer has been saying. Yes. And I was, I was really taken apart by that. It was really painful. So that led to the one, uh, one bite without a fight, or just one day I got invited to services with Miss Kozer and at the congregation there. And when I was invited, I thought, I'll go once because it's about a, a film about Israel. And how a film about Israel can't be about Jesus. So that's what I thought, well, I'll do. I'll go that one time. <laughs> so when we come back, I'll tell you about, <laughs> about uh, going to see that film. Okay, so we're going to take a break here. It's fan- uh, this is just fascinating. Michael, yeah. this is so fascinating, and I have a lot more questions, but we'll get to those in a minute. Yeah, well, good. I'll, I'll try my best to answer them. I look back, I think I hardly have talked about this, but I'm glad to talk about it because I think God's working in my life, was working. We're going to be right back with more of the story of how I came to know Jesus 50 years ago. Stay with us. So glad you stuck around with us. This is Open Line with Michael Rydelnik, my guest today, guest host, uh, guest interviewer, Chris Favory. Glad you're with us, too. You know, uh, this week is Passover, and it lasts for the whole week. It's such a meaningful celebration of redemption, and to help you appreciate the significance of this festival, Chosen People Ministries is offering a free book called The Gospel and the Passover. It reveals how Exodus foreshadows our own redemption through the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, our Passover lamb. For your free copy, just go to openlineradio.org. That's our website. Click on the link that says a free gift from Chosen People Ministries. Don't miss out. You'll love this book. Well, Chris, uh, I was just at the point when I was telling the story of going to services. Yes. Well, Does it that strikes me that, that I was going. Yeah, it strikes me that you, with your mom, you were trying to save your mom from this big mistake, and oh yeah, you know, you're trying to pull her back from the brink of of this, you know, awful thing she's doing with his life. And what happened was, you encountered God's saving grace, right? Yeah, I went to this service. Just I, they, my mom said it's going to be a film about Israel. I figure if it's about Israel. It can't be about Jesus. What does he have to do with Israel? And so I said, I'll go that one time. And so there I was at uh, the service, and it was a film by Billy Graham, whom I had never heard of. I didn't know who he was. And it was called His Land. It starred Cliff Barrows and Cliff Richard, the rock and roll singer. Yeah, sure. Which was, uh, and it was all about Israel. And I was agreeing with it, because the first half was all about how the Hebrew prophets had foretold the restoration of Israel. And I agreed with that. And then the second half was about how the Hebrew prophets had uh, foretold Jesus the Messiah. And I folded my arms and got angry. I thought, that's wrong. And I sat there thinking about all that I had talked about with Miss Kozer, and I thought, if Jesus had fulfilled these prophecies... And if he had been the final atonement, the way Isaiah 53 has described him, 
well, then if I wanted to be a good Jew, which was really important to me, I would believe in the Jewish Messiah. He had to be the Jewish Messiah. And so <laughs> I was sitting there struggling about this whole thing. Uh, and the man who had shown the film, you know, they came with the projector. He was from the Billy Graham Association. He projected. He got up afterwards and he gave something that I had never heard of, an invitation. He mm -hmm. said, I want everyone to bow their heads and their hearts, which is, I guess that meant putting your head down and your chest. I didn't know what he meant. And everyone close their eyes and it'll just between you and me if you would like to put your trust in Jesus, and he kind of explained what that meant, to believe that he died for you and rose again, uh, and then your sins will be forgiven, would you raise your hand? And I thought, I'm not going to raise my hand in front of all these people. I wanted to, if I did it, I would just do it secretly. But he kind of pressed, and I just was shocked. I sat there, and all of a sudden I saw my hand going up. I was, I was flabbergasted. And... Uh, he said, I see that hand, and I thought, I will never tell a soul. Before I could put my hand down, after he said, I see that hand, who was the, he was the only guy that was supposed to see it. My mom's one of those Jewish, middle-aged Jewish ladies that my mom was friends with. She was in the front row, and he said, I see that hand, and she thought it might have been her son's friend who had also come to the service. And so she tucked her head under her elbow and looked in the back where he said he saw that hand and said, in front of the whole place, 200 people, oh, it's Michael. And I was completely busted <laughs> immediately. And uh, my sister came up to me afterwards, and she was furious. She had come that day, and I had several times talked her out of believing, my oldest mm -hmm. sister. And uh, she was furious with me. And that afternoon, she actually went to lunch with Miss Kozer and came to faith as well. Really? Yeah, so it's her 50th birthday on April 16th uh, today. Uh, and then uh, Miss Kozer came up and she said, do you have a Bible? I said, sure, I have a Bible. I have a Hebrew Bible. It's got a silver cover with a lot of stones on it, these kind of turquoise stones. She says, no, no, one with the New Testament. So she gave me a Bible. And I'm like, oh. And my mom came up to me and she was jumping up and down. And I said, mom, get back. I'm not going to be a fanatic like you. Stop it. <laughs> I'm never going to tell a soul. And... Uh, that's what my, and I just didn't want to, I said, I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to do anything different. So I believe in Jesus now and that's it. And, uh, that's, that's all I said. And I left and I was kind of still grumpy when I left, honestly. I just ran into my best friend from those years. I went to see him in New York and he said to my son, he says, you know, your dad and I, we used to talk about things and he was so angry about your mom believing this stuff and he went away on friday from school and he was still angry and then on monday he comes and he told me he believes it like what happened <laughs> and so that's what he said to me in december and i, I said oh, let me tell you what happened and i told the story to him but it really was a shock and i was not intending to ever ever change and then uh i did you know <laughs> god has a way of getting a hold of us uh so what happened was uh, I got a phone call from one of the guys in the youth group in this congregation, invited me to Bible study. And I said, not interested, not going to be a fanatic. And he said, come on, we'd really like you. And then I thought, I said, there was a really cute strawberry blonde girl I saw at this, by, at this service. Is she going to be there? And he said, yeah, she will. I said, okay, I'll come once. And I, I was just to see that girl. He never told me that was his girlfriend. Uh, and I went to the Bible study. So, wow. And that changed my life. That, I think, really turned me into a fanatic. Had you not read so. the New Testament then before that? No. No. Wow. Never. You, you had, you'd seen the, the Charlie Brown Christmas thing, that, right? Yeah, that's the only time I'd ever heard the yeah. New Testament. That was the only wow. time. Exactly. I'd never read it for myself. Uh, yeah, so there I was. uh and I was really grateful because they had a, an English Bible. Miss Kozer had given me one that was Shakespearean, uh, <laughs> King James Version. Yes. They handed me a Bible in, in modern English, and I thought, oh, I can understand this. And it was a verse from the New Testament uh, that we were studying, 2 Timothy 2.15. It, 
it was steady to show yourself approved to God as a workman that need not be ashamed, accurately handling the mm. word of truth. And uh, I thought, yeah, I have to handle the Bible the way my dad handled a piece of oak. Mm. That's what I thought, a workman that was unashamed. And I said, I just want to read this book and study it and teach it. And I want to teach it, especially to Jewish people who don't know anything about it. And I think that's when re God really got a hold of my heart and I became a fanatic. I'm convinced <laughs> of that. So, and then I Isn't get to it, Moody, and, and it's, that's the theme verse of Moody Bible Institute. Right, right later. on the corner, the cornerstone there. Isn't yeah. it interesting that, that you know, your heart is toward Jewish people because that's, you know, that's where you come from, and now mm -hmm. you're speaking to so many Gentiles on the radio yeah. every week and talking about rightly dividing God's Word. Yeah, and you know what I think is interesting is that so many of the people who listen to Open Line write to me and they say they have a heart for telling Jewish people about Jesus because of learning the Bible with me on Saturday mornings. Isn't that cool? Mm, that so, is very cool. Yeah. Hey, thank you for joining me for this hour. We're going to be back with another hour in just a moment. That's the first hour. Keep listening. Second hour of Open Lines coming up on most of these stations. And you can always check us out if your station doesn't carry it on the Moody Radio app or listen online, get the podcast. During the break, check out our webpage, openlineradio.org. It's got all sorts of links you'll find helpful. Uh, how to get our current Bible study resource or how to become a kitchen table partner. Whatever it is, you can find it there. Second hour of Open Line is coming up straight ahead with more discussion about the Bible, God, and the spiritual life. Stay with us. Open Line with Dr. Michael Ray Delnick is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute.